Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning, how are you? I got up this morning and uh, I heard the rain outside and so I opened up my phone, I was gonna look at the weather and see what the weather was and yesterday we were in Tulsa and so uh, when I pulled up my weather this morning, it, I didn't know it was still on Tulsa and so when I pulled it up, it said 17 degrees and snow showers. And I got so excited. I, I was like, for real? And of course it was raining outside and I was like, that's some heavy snow. And I got up and I looked outside and I was like, Oh, Tulsa. Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know where spring is, but hopefully it'll get here soon. Amen. Uh, I, I'm ready for it. Uh, as we continue our series in growing in maturity, uh, we're at our halfway point right now in our series. And so I want to show you this acrostic because if you remember back in John chapter six or in John chapter 16, Jesus said, I've told you all these things and all these things he's told us. We've been going back to John chapter 12. And, and so over the last few weeks, we've been looking at death to self, imitation of Jesus, serving others, and today we're going to be looking at impacting faith. And so if you have your Bibles or your apps, we're going to be in John chapter 14. But you know, I, I really want to go back to, to review real quick that, that death to self. That really is the prerequisite to everything else. Because if we're not dead to self, you're not going to imitate Jesus. If you're not dead to self, you're not going to serve others. If you're not dead to self, you're not going to have a committed love. And, and can I just be honest? If you don't get this dead to self, this deny self down, you're not going to make an impact, which is what we're going to talk about today. And so it all kind of starts with that one thing of death to self. If you want to grow into maturity, and there's a whole lot of talk about what maturity is. And if you ask 10 people, we've said over the last few weeks, you get probably 10 different answers with some with the same stuff. But this is what it looks like to mature in Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus means that you die to self and you do what Jesus does. That's what it means to be maturing. And so let's kind of review where we are in this passage and kind of go back and look at, if you remember Jesus was in the upper room and he's having a conversation. And remember in John chapter 16, I've told you all these things. So he's preparing them because they now have come into Jerusalem. They're having the Passover meal. We, we believe that for the last three years that Jesus has been walking with these guys, they always observe the Passover meal together. We don't know that for sure, but we know this year they are there. And if you go over into Luke, you find out as they're at that meal that the disciples 
disciples were still struggling with this whole death to self because they were having an argument about who's the greatest among them. And so very quietly, Jesus gets up and, and he begins to wash their feet. And uh, then we found out just a few weeks ago that as Jesus was washing their feet, he came to the end and he was talking to them. We know that G Judas, who betrayed Jesus, exits the room right after Jesus washes their feet. And then Jesus walks them through the end of chapter 13 and he basically just takes them apart uh, because he comes to Peter and he kind of picks on Peter a little bit and says, Peter, you're gonna deny me three times. And so here's this huge scene where they're all sitting there together. They're having a meal. They thought that they were these great men and they find out right in the middle of this meal they're not as great as they thought they were. They're not as, as far along as they thought they were. And so Jesus picks up in chapter 14, verse one. Let's look at it together because now that all the pretension and all the pride is out of the room and these guys have been told, you're not as big as you think you are. I know you were just arguing. I know you didn't wash my feet. And by the way, you're gonna deny me. And, and not once, but three times. And so he comes to him in John 14, one, and he says this, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So Jesus here is just kind of comfort him. He, he's told him all these things. I'm about to die. You're going to betray me. You, you, you've already done it. And uh, they're all kind of sitting in that room together. And Jesus says, look, guys, it's okay. And we jump down to verse 4. He says to this, he says, and you know the way where I'm going. Remember, he told him he was going to go away. And they all panicked. And they all were like, man, our security blanket's leaving. And everything we know is fixing to leave. Where are you going? And Jesus looks at him and says, you know the way. Not, not you eventually know the way. Not that you're going to find out the way. You already know the way. Presently, right now, you know the way. You see, the disciples have been with him for three years. They'd seen the miracles. They'd heard his message. They'd seen his words. They'd walked with him. And they'd come to believe that he was the Messiah. So here's what, I, I kind of want to pause right here. Because I said, I was thinking last week as I left, um, for many of you that, that come to Summit, you, you come here because it's safe. You come here because we don't look like what you grew up with, amen? I, I told a buddy of mine uh, yesterday as we were talking, or a couple days ago, he invited me to come do a revival this week because the speaker uh, got ill. And I said, you realize that I'm, I don't own a suit and uh, I, I don't look like y'all do. It's a First Baptist Church. I said, you know, you've had Rick Warren's mentor all weekend and I'm, I'm not him. I'm, I'm more ZZ Top, amen? <laughs> I mean, and he's like, I, I know. He said, come on. So you pray for me, all right? I'll start that tonight. But see, here, here's what I want to say to you guys. I, I, I think for some of you, you come in this room and because we love you and because it's such a safe place, that sometimes there's this whole idea that you can grow into maturity when you don't have a relationship with Jesus. By the way, everything Jesus is teaching in this series, in this passage we looked at is to believers. It's people that have a relationship with Jesus. It's people that's already given their life to Jesus. And so I'll say this, if you're, not in, if you're in this room and you've not surrendered your life to Jesus, I, I wanna tell you this, information does not lead to transformation, okay? Uh, now hear me, information doesn't lead to transformation. The only thing that leads to transformation is the fact that you and I die to ourselves and surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. And that's transformation. And so everything that Jesus is talking about here is talking about transformation. He's talking to believers. Now, if you're an unbeliever in this room this morning, I just want to say, number one, I'm glad you're here. But number two, if you're going to see what we're teaching over these last few months, if you're listening online or watching on TV, if you want to know what real transformation is, then it starts with Jesus. It starts with you and I surrendering our life to Jesus, realizing we're a sinner, our sin separates us from God, and then surrendering our life through confession and repentance and entering into a relationship with Jesus. See, Jesus looked at his disciples, and these guys have been with him. Remember, there was one in, the, in that group that was not a believer. That was Judas, who left. He walked with Jesus for three years and was never transformed. Think about that. Maybe you're here this morning, and you've been here for three years, four years, maybe ten years. But you've never been transformed by the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because you've never repented of your sins, confessed that he is Lord, and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you've been saved. See, you could be like a Judas in the room. I know, 
It's kind of hard to say that, isn't it? It's kind of even hard to hear that. See, transformation comes from Jesus. And so Jesus is looking at these guys going, guys, you already know the way. And I love Thomas because you remember the last time we saw Thomas, if you go back to John chapter 11, when Jesus was moving into Jerusalem and, he was, and, and the disciples knew this is not a safe place. This is not a place you need to go. And Thomas goes, hey, let us go with you, Jesus, so we can die with you. Thomas had no idea what he was saying. And then Thomas comes in this passage and verse five, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? God, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And so Jesus, in that famous verse in John chapter 14, verse six, he said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. In other words, Thomas, I've been in front of you for three years. You know the way. I am the way. This isn't something you do. This is a relationship you have. I am the way. You see, knowing Jesus, automatically we know the Father. When you know Jesus, you know the Father because they are one and the same. And you can't ignore this statement. You can't just run past it because we've always heard it. Jesus is saying he is the way, not a way. I am the way. There is no other way. It's exclusive. And people get all up in their heads about that. The disciples, like most of us in the world, have a hard time believing that it's that simple. That well, all we have to do is believe Jesus Christ. We always wanna add something, clean up, get a haircut, wear the right clothes. And the disciples were thinking it can't be that simple. Remember last week when, when Jesus said, you, they'll know that you're my disciples but way you love one another and how simple that is. That Jesus makes it so simple. Simply believe in Jesus and love him and that's it. That's what it means to know the Father. Then Philip jumps in. In verse eight, look at this. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. In other words, it wasn't enough that Jesus was there. And don't judge Philip too harsh because we do it too, right? God, hey, I know what you said, Jesus, but I'm telling you, if you will just, just, just show me this and I'll do that. God, if you'll, just, if you'll just show me this, then I'll go there. And God, if you'll just do this and I'll walk through that door. We're always trying to get God to perform. <laughs> and yet here's Jesus going, I'm the way. Philip goes, okay, I know you're the way, but show us God and then we'll believe. And look what Jesus says in verses nine through 11. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. I love verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Isn't that a great statement? And if you're not gonna believe my words, then look at what I've done. Same for us today. We have the record of Jesus, his words. We saw what he does. And guess what? Those are the basis of our beliefs. What Jesus did, what Jesus said, who Jesus was. Then in verse 12, Jesus says this, truly, truly, in other words, listen up. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And we love that, don't we? We love that, don't we? But yet, when you really sat down and start looking at it, it's probably the most perplexing statement in our day that Jesus has said up to this point. I mean, think about this. It's powerful. Here's what Jesus is saying in a nutshell. What I did is just normal Christianity for what you should look like. Think about that. Jesus is simply saying, if you follow me, you deny yourself, then what I do is just normal. And see, we read that kind of stuff and we look at that and you go, well, okay, that's what pastors do. That's what veteran Christians do. They're the ones that pray over people and they're the ones that do what Jesus did. That's not for me. Jesus says for anyone, whoever believes in me will do what I did. Now just think about that. Pure and simple will do the works that I do. 
Jesus is saying, if you're a believer, you've died to self, then listen and understand, you will be an impact in the world because you're gonna do what I did. Whoever believes in me is not an uncommon statement for the disciples. It's not an uncommon statement for us. They had heard it before. They had heard Jesus say in John 6, 35, whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So if you believe in Jesus, you won't thirst. Whoever believes in me out of his heart will flow rivers of living water in John chapter seven. Again, he says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live in John chapter 11. And John 12, 46, whoever believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus saying, listen, it's normal that if you believe in me, you're going to do what I did. It's amazing. It's just normal that this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to grow up into maturity is that you're going to do what Jesus did. It's just normal. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, you will do. But here's where the problem comes in. This is where it gets really perplexing. You ready for this? Because up to this point in the Gospel of John, Jesus turned water into wine in John chapter two. Anybody do that lately? Anybody want to do that last night? Just kidding. Thank you. In John chapter four, he read the mind of a Samaritan woman. Anybody read the mind of your wife lately, Ben? No, you don't want to. In John chapter four, he healed the official son who was sick. In John chapter five, he healed the man crippled for 38 years. In John chapter six, or John chapter five, he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Anybody else done that? Cafeteria ladies? No. He healed a man crippled of 38 years in John chapter five. He fed 5,000 people. He walked on water. Okay, thank you. He healed a man born blind. That's John 9. And let's don't forget in John chapter 11, he raised Lazarus from the dead after four days in the grave. He stunk. Okay, now I ask you a question. What in the world did Jesus mean that you're gonna do the same thing I did? We create a problem, don't we? It's kind of a paradox. Did Jesus mean that we're gonna do all those things? How about one or two of them? Maybe three. And, and there's some in, 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 in the world, I wanna be careful here, I wanna be so careful here. There's some in, the, in, in, in Christianity, that I use that term loosely, that believe if you don't do that, you're not saved. <laughs> and so all of a sudden we're looking at this and in a lot of the New Testament where miracles are mentioned and gifts are given and, and some Christians have them and some Christians don't. And then Jesus makes a statement like this. It says, you're gonna do the same things I do. We kind of stop and go, I haven't walked on water. I haven't raised anyone from the dead. So what did Jesus mean, right? I think, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says this, and it's so important that, that we connect the dots here because Paul is talking about the manifestation of the Spirit, that, that, that God gives us spiritual gifts and he gives us certain things. And here's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10 and 29 and 30. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It's not for us. It's for the common good. It's that we're making much of Jesus, that what God's given us, we're pointing to him. We're gonna see that in a minute. For one is given through the Spirit that utterance of wisdom, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another working of miracles. And then he begins to ask some questions and he doesn't answer them because they're assumed, right? He says, do all work miracles? And what would be the answer? No. Do all possess the gift of healing? Then we would empty the hospitals, right? Kind okay, of think about this. Do all speak with tongues? Okay. I think what Jesus was saying here, when you will do what I do, that all believers will do miracle, miracles and all believers will do what he does. But what he's saying is, is, is that not everyone will do exactly what I do. Cross every T, dot every I. 
to make the connection, you got to look at verses 11 and 12 and put them together. And, and in verse 11, he says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. So in other words, that word believe and works, they occur together in verses 11, just like it occurs in verse 12. Now stick with me here. I want you to see this because Jesus' works are designed to help people believe. He, in other words, he says this, everything you've seen me do is so that you would believe in me. And if you don't believe my words, then believe what I'm doing. Everything Jesus did pointed that we would believe in him, that we would believe in him and all the way to the Father who sent him. It's very important you catch this. Believe because of the works. Jesus is saying, listen, my verbal testimony is leaving doubts in your mind about who I am. Just look at my works. Look at what I'm doing. And then verse 12, he says, truly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, you will do. So you put them together, verse 11, my works function to lead people to faith in me. That's what Jesus is talking about. My works function to lead people in faith to me. And then verse 12 says, when you believe in me, I'm gonna work in you and your works like mine will lead people to faith. So. Let, let, let me kind of connect the dots here. If you're growing into maturity, just like Jesus' life pointed people to believe in him and faith, then you and I, if we're growing in maturity, our lives will point people to believe in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to have an impact. So the connection here in verses 11 and 12 kind of goes like this. Believe in me on account of my works. Let my works lead you to faith because whoever believes in me will also do the works that lead people to believe in me. That God wants us to live in such a way that people look at our lives and believe in Christ Jesus. That's what his works do. And he's saying at least that's what believers works do that the works that point people to faith is what we're gonna do. Just like what Jesus did when he walked the earth, pointed people to believe in the Father. That our works, our life is a display that Jesus is trustworthy. That people would look at our lives as we mature, as we grow into maturity, that they would look at our lives and they may not believe everything about the Bible. They may not believe that Old Testament. They may not believe the, the, all that kind of weird stuff that you do, but they're looking at your life and they're looking at the way you live and they're looking at the things you do and they should walk away. They're going, you know what? I'm not sure about all that other stuff, but Jesus sure looks trustworthy in you. Oh man, that's impactful. That's impactful. See, John says that all mature believers would be marked by this, that we would be so united with Jesus that we would carry on his work by his power and do the kind of things that Jesus did and bear witness about Jesus, that we would point people to Jesus. Remember last week when Jesus said this, by this all men will know that you're my disciples by how you love one another, that the way that we do do unto each other by action, by love, by forgiving, that the way we treat each other, that we're pointing people to Jesus. In Matthew chapter five, verse 16, he says, let your light shine before others <laughs> that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who's in heaven. In other words, he wants us to live in such a way that all of our life shines on Jesus. That everything we do shines towards him. And it's not about us. Again, death to self. It's not about us. That we should live in such a way that when people look at our lives, that we are shining on God's glory. <laughs> However many Christians that God may give gifts to, I don't know, and I don't know necessarily what they all look like, but I know this, whatever he gives us and whatever works he gives us to do, that it all should be pointing back to him that when people look at our lives, there should be an aroma of Christ, a lot of the world, that we're dead. But we've been made alive in Christ Jesus that we would do the same works that he does. And so that when people look at our lives, we're pointing to him. And Ephesians 2.10 says, and we are alive created in Christ Jesus for good works, the works that Jesus did, which God prepared beforehand, that we would walk in them. That God just designed, that listen, if you're gonna follow me, doing what I did is just normal Christianity. Amen. But we get hung up on all the things that Jesus did. Well, why can't I raise somebody from the dead? 
Why can't I speak in nine different tongues? Why can't I do that? You know who that's about? That's about you. When all along, it's about the father. See, I've learned this as an earthly father. I don't give my kids everything they ask for. One, I would be broke. Amen? And two, it would make them the most self-centered people on earth. Because they would grow up thinking that the world owes them something and owes them everything. And guess what? The Father gives to us what he deems necessary for our gifts and the way he's created us so that the way we live our life will point everything towards him. You see, doing what Jesus did is just normal. But the problem is we get to that second part of chapter, uh, verse 12, because Jesus then goes on, look what it says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And then this is the fun part. And even greater works than these will he do. And so again, he's saying this is everybody. Not only are you gonna do what I do and that's normal, you're gonna do greater things. And we go, oh, what? Because I'm gonna tell you where I go because I'm struggling with that death to self. Can I just be honest with you? I struggle with that because immediately when I see that, I'm going, bam, I'm gonna raise somebody from the dead. <laughs> you know, every funeral I do, this is no lie. Every funeral I do, I always, when I'm driving here or I'm driving to the funeral home, driving, I'll ask the Lord, God, <laughs> some of you know what I'm about to pray. <laughs> and I'll ask, oh, God, wouldn't it be cool if you raised me from the dead? Mess that funeral up. I pray that every time. I, I know some of you are going, you're twisted. I know that. But when you look at this and he says, greater works than these you'll do because I go to the Father again, every believer, not just apostles, not just pastors, elders, charismatics, evangelists. He's saying, whoever believes in me, that's for us. Those of us who call ourselves Christians, those of us who have surrendered to Jesus Christ, he's saying, look, you'll do not only what I do, and that's normal, you'll do greater things. And if you think greater works means more miraculous, you're gonna be hard pressed to exceed walking on water. You're gonna be hard pressed feeding 5,000 with five pieces of bread and two fish, amen? Oh, don't forget, raising from the dead, surpass that. See, I, I've been doing this a long time, I've been all over the world. And I don't know of any Christian outside or inside the New Testament who's ever done all of those miracles, let alone something more miraculous than those. Amen? So again, we go back to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Which means that when Jesus said, whoever believes in me, greater works than these, he will do because I go to the Father. He probably did not mean that every Christian was expected to do these great and miraculous things better and bigger than Jesus, okay? No apostle, no missionary, no Christian that's ever done that. So what does he mean? And by the way, for some of you guys that are struggling right now going, yeah, but Edward, what about healing? And what about that? Hang tight because after Easter, we're gonna go there, okay? So that means some of you need to come back, all right? Don't just drop out when one spring break hits because we're gonna get into the Holy Spirit and we're gonna find out what that means. But in context, when we're looking at this and we're trying to figure out, okay, Jesus, you said we're gonna do what you did and we're gonna do even greater things than you did, then how do we reconcile that? Well, in John chapter 12 and John chapter 20, I think it answers. And again, I don't have the definitive answer on this. This is just from my study and what I'm looking at. I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure this Holy Spirit. Listen, part of the Holy Spirit is that there is a mystery to the Holy Spirit. Do you agree with that? There's a mystery to that. So I'm not going to stand up here and go, bless God, I got it all figured out. I, I'm scared of those people. When somebody gets up and says, I've got it all figured out, I, I'm going to step back a minute. So I'm just being honest with you. I don't have all this figured out, but when I look in context of the scripture in John 14, 12, he says, in greater works than these, talking about he, every believer will do because I go to the Father. The other clue I think is found in John chapter 20. Look at this in verses 21 and 23, because this is where Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's standing before his disciples. He says, so Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Again, he's comforting them just like he did in John chapter 14 and chapter 20, he's comforting them again. He says, peace 
be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. In other words, the walking with Jesus, doing what I'm doing is just normal. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. So we have these two passages here. In John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus is saying that we will not only continue to do his works, we'll do greater works. And we find that Jesus on his way when he said that, that Jesus goes to the cross, he lays down his life for us, that he raises from the dead, ascends to God from where he sends the Holy Spirit to us. In John chapter 20, he's risen from the dead, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's in front of his disciples, and he comes and makes an appearance and he fills them with the Holy Spirit. Now listen, this is incredible. And, and, and where Jesus had always imparted forgiveness, he now gives the command through the Holy Spirit that the disciples now have the authority, don't miss this, they now have the authority to forgive sins, not based on what they do, but based on what Jesus Christ has already accomplished on the cross. Now think about that for a minute. That's even greater than what Jesus did. Because no one in the history of the world up to this point had anyone ever been forgiven by faith in the already crucified, already risen, already reigning, already indwelling Christ Jesus. Salvation up to this point was, was by anticipation, by a promise of the coming Redeemer. And now Jesus is changing everything that Jesus had gone to the Father been crucified and buried and exalted and purchased the forgiveness of sins. And it was no longer an anticipation. It was now done, finished. For 4,000 years, it was anticipation of what was coming. And now Jesus in John chapter 20 and in John chapter 12, he's saying, guys, you're gonna do great things. You're gonna do what I do, but you're gonna even do greater things. Now that greater thing is that we are involved with that, that we now get to proclaim the forgiveness of sins of others, not based on something that's gonna happen, but based on something that's already happened, that's already been accomplished. I'm telling you, it's huge. It's huge. I think in essence, Jesus was saying, even when I've forgiven sinners during my earthly life, I've forgiven them in anticipation of that, but you're gonna forgive them in my name on the finished basis of what I've done. The spirit in you will be the spirit of the crucified and risen Christ. And the message in the life that you live and the message in the life that you preach is not of a promised ransom, but a paid ransom. That it's done, that Jesus accomplished he was the only one to ever predict and pull off his death and resurrection. And we get to proclaim that today. When Jesus was telling them, I'm gonna rise from the dead in three days, they were like, yeah, right. Right? They wanted to believe. They had read the Old Testament. They knew what God said was gonna happen. But you know there was something in them going, ah. I'm believing, and that's why Jesus said, if you don't believe my words, believe my works. But now you and I, we actually have evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we get to preach that, and when people look at our life, that we are preaching that trustworthiness of Jesus by the way we live. I'm telling you, this is impactful, that we would be made new. You see, the first part of what Jesus was saying is, look, you're gonna do what I did, that's normal but you're gonna do even greater things because everything that Jesus was talking about is that everything would point to him. That when people would look at our life, they wouldn't see Summit Heights, they wouldn't be Baptist, they wouldn't see Methodist, they wouldn't see a denomination, that they would see Jesus, man. Amen. That Jesus is trustworthy. You can believe in him. And listen, it may not agree with that whole splitting of the Red Sea, which I believe it did because Jesus did. He's the only God ever did, pulled off his death and resurrection. Amen? So if he believed it, I believe it. But listen, I'm not asking you to believe that. I'm asking you to believe in Jesus. I'm asking you to believe in Jesus. By this, all men will know. You know why Jesus said that? Because our lives should be in such a way that when people look at us, they see Jesus. And by the way, can I just say this? If they don't, then what do they see? What do they see? When they look at you, when they look at me, you see, we know enough Christianese, we can, 
Jesus juke people. Amen? We can shut them down a little bit. Because we know enough Christianese. You see, people aren't listening to our words. They're looking at our lives. And they're asking the question, is Jesus trustworthy? You see, to grow into maturity means your life makes an impact. And the way your life makes an impact is that you do the things that Jesus did. Imitation of Jesus. Jesus imitated the Father. We imitate Jesus. The only way you can do that is to die to self. If you can't die to self, you're not going to imitate Jesus. If you don't die to self, you're not going to make an impact. You're not going to be transformed. You're going to be informed, but you're not going to be transformed. Follow me? So let's cover the last thing, and then we'll go home. Ready? See, the second part is you're going to do greater things. First part is you're going to do what Jesus did. Here's the third part. In John chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, here's what he says. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Here, here, here's what Jesus is saying. Again, look at the context, okay? Look at the context where it is, because some of us read that verse, we'll pull those two verses out of context, and we'll think, hey, I can just have a Tahoe. Because that's what I'm on. I ask in Jesus' name. I ask, I ask Peter's Autoplex all day long. I went to Pelche too, and I ask in Jesus' name if you give me a Tahoe. And you know what? They didn't give me a Tahoe. Let's get in context, okay? Here's what Jesus said. You have everything you need to do the works. As you seek to carry out my work in the world, as you seek to let your light shine, as you live in love, as you offer forgiveness of sins in the name of the crucified and risen Christ, then go ahead and ask for whatever you need and I'm gonna give it to you. Notice what all that is about. Did you see the new house in there? Did you see your new husband in there? You see the new wife, the Skeeter Bass, Follow me? It's amazing what we'll read in because we hadn't died to self, okay? Only one condition, verse 13 and 14. Here's what he says. Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. If you ask for anything in my name, I will do it. So Jesus is saying here, listen, only one condition. Now I know in other places he said, abide in me and if you abide in me and I'll abide in you, you ask whatever you will. He's not negating ask according to his will, believe his word because I think it's all the same here. That Jesus is saying, it's my name. The power is not in you, it's in my name. So you ask in my name, I'm gonna give you what you need so that people look at your life and people get around you and people see you, that people are gonna look at you and what you ask in my name, I'm gonna give you everything you need so that people look at you and they're gonna say, you know what? Jesus is trustworthy because it's not about us. Growing in maturity means that we are making an impact that you ask in my name. He says, I'm gonna give you the Holy Spirit. I'll give you the power of the crucified risen Christ. And I promise that you can ask for anything in my name. When it comes to people believing in me, when it comes to people knowing the Father, I'm gonna give you whatever you need when you ask in my name. And if you put every request through that filter, through the filter of God's glory, through the filter of God's fame, his worth, our purchase, all through that, when you begin to ask God through that lens, here's what God says, I'll give it to you. It's in my name. And you'll have everything you need to do the works that I do. Amen. But it starts with death to self. And my friends, let me tell you something. When you and I begin to do what Jesus did by living a life that when people look at us, they go, you know what, Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus is trustworthy. I don't understand all that stuff y'all say. I look at your life, and I don't really get it. I'm telling you, Jesus is trustworthy. Just by looking at that, that's an impact. The problem is many of us haven't died to self. And Joe Fields was telling me before the service today, and I, I literally, I thought, man, do I share this this morning? But it's so good. You want to know what death to self looks like? Go out and find you a cemetery. Just drive down the road today to Holly Tree Chapel Cemetery. Get out of your car and just choose a grave. Just choose a grave. Go to that grave and start calling that person every name in the book. Talk about their family. Talk about their kids. Talk about their dog. Talk about their cat. Talk about how they should have had a cat, how they should have had a dog, and wait for them to rise up and defend themselves. They can't. You want to know why? They're dead to self. 
That's where it starts. You want to grow up? Die. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he live. Whoever believes in me, he says. That's not for the super religious. That's, that's for you. That's for you. That's for me. It's for all of us. You'll never thirst. You'll never be in darkness. But you've got to believe in the power of the risen, crucified Jesus Christ. Amen? Do you know him? Have you ever surrendered your life to him? I know I ask you if you've been to church. I'm just asking a simple question. Have you ever died to self by realizing your sin separates you and you've repented of that and you've confessed that and you've invited him to be the Lord of your life? If you've not done that, and I invite you right now to do that, would you? Let's pray together. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, I, I don't want you to just be informed. I want you to be transformed. And maybe you're watching with us this morning, and maybe you've never been transformed. You're informed. But have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you ever confessed your sins and said, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I believe. Come on, just pray with me. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave for me. Forgive me. I surrender my life to you. If you prayed that prayer this morning in this room, would you just be honest? No one looking around, just every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you just be honest and say, Edward, I just prayed that prayer and lift your hand? Anybody? Anybody be willing to say, man, I just prayed that? Maybe you're online and you're listening today and maybe you prayed that. I want you to reach out to us. Send us an email. Let us know. Call us. We would love to walk with you on that. That we would walk out of this place today, church, with every head bowed and every eye closed, we'd walk out of this church today and be an impacting faith that when people look at us, they see Jesus. And they walk away going, Jesus is trustworthy. I believe that. I want some of that. Let's grow up. Let's grow up. See, surrendering your life to Jesus is surrendering your life to imitate him, to do what he did. And Jesus said, you know what, that's normal. That's what you're going to do. You're going to look like me and act like me, so go do it. And you're going to do even greater things because I'm already going to have raised from the dead. And I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to empower you. Now go do it. So, Lord, I pray you give us courage to walk out of this room, to live a life of impact. As we die to cells, we would serve God, we would imitate you, that we would be committed in how we love each other. And God, we would make an impact, not for us, but for you, that when people look at us, they would see you. So I love you. Bless my family as they leave today. Keep them safe as they drive in this weather. And I pray for the next service as they come. Keep them safe, that more people may know Jesus. I love you. We ask it in his name. Everybody said? Amen. Hey, I love you. I know that was tough. I know that was uh, a lot of teaching today. Go home, meditate on that, make an impact this week, and I'll see you next week. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.